Hey, everybody. I'm here with my good buddy, Kyle Wilson. Hey, Kyle. Hey, Ken. Great to be here. Yeah. Th- so uh, I've known Kyle a long time, and uh, we got introduced to uh, mutual friends. Uh, birds of a feather flock together. Right. right. So uh, what's been most impressive for me is uh, you guys better listen here. So Kyle is the only person that's ever made Jim Rohn money. Now, did I say that? I'm sorry if I said that, but... Uh, it's true. I think so. So you created Jim Rohn International and brought him to massive fame and fortune and, and stages all over the world. And I'll tell you what, you know, I wish I would have met him because I still study his stuff. It's beyond belief, this stuff. So let's talk a little bit about... How did you meet him? And, you know, tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, Jim was this uh, amazing philosopher, uh, you know, and and had a way of taking something complex and making it simple. But he wasn't a marketer, right? And he wasn't really a business guy. And so that's why we had a great marriage. It's a great, it's like the perfect marriage. Uh, But how I met Jim, you know, I grew up in a small town. I never went to college. And at the age of uh, 26, I made the decision to leave my small town. I just like I felt like I was a big fish in a, you know, small pond, and I moved to Dallas. And again, my first business was a detail shop. So again, far away from running Jim Rohn International. Right. And you know, I got in trouble. I did drugs. So I'm not the candidate you would think to partner with Jim Rohn. But at age 26, I moved to Dallas. I ended up going to a seminar about a year later. And the guy promoting the seminar offered me a job. He had a thing afterwards and said, hey, who's looking maybe to come work with us? And I attended, and uh, they went around the room. And I was the least candidate to get a job in the seminar business. I very uncomfortable speaking, and there were, you know, pastors and all these guys who were just really elegant. But it's a sales position at the end of the day. And you had to make 100 phone calls a day to book a couple of meetings, to go speak at a company, to bring value, then to sell tickets uh, to an event. And he was promoting a couple of guys. And I found out later these couple of guys, along with the guy that hired me, Jerry Haynes, had worked for Jim Rohn back in the day when Tony Robbins worked with him. It's a company called Adventures and Achievement. And I ended up becoming Jerry's number one guy. And one day he called me and said, hey, my mentor, Jim Rohn, I've got him to come back, and he's going to, you know, we'll start promoting him. Tony Robbins' mentor, too, <laughs> right, by the way. Right, And Jerry was in Dallas. That's that's where he trained me. And he said, I am leaving in the morning to, to Los Angeles. I'm going to launch Los Angeles. I'm going to hire sales guys. And that was the model. You know, if you went to those Tom Hopkins events, you know, they had sales teams that would go yep. do exactly what I, I went did. went to those. Yep. Yeah. And he said, you got Dallas. And so I did six, over the next year, I did six little 200-person, 300-person events. I ran on myself, but I was by far his number one guy. And Jim would come in the night before, and we'd have dinner. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really a cool thing. And I that did, must have been awesome. It was. And I, I did that for a couple of years, and I learned so much. I know we're going to talk about that. But I later went on. I wasn't making any money. So I was the number one guy in the company going broke, literally. And I finally said, I got to go out on my own. How do I go from 200 people to 2,000 people? Eventually, I went out on my own, but then I started hiring Jim to speak. So I'd do a big event with 2,000 people, 2,500 people, and I would hire Jim Rohn, hire Brian Tracy, hire Og Mandino to you know speak at the events. And then eventually, uh, Jerry, the guy that hired me, and Jim broke up, I think, According to Jim, Jerry owed him four hundred thousand, and that's the second time. That's a lot of money. Well, you know, going back to Adventures and Achievement, when Tony worked for him, you know, Jim says, "Hey, we were filling up rooms, and it was this and that, and we were the biggest." And seven hundred thousand later in the hole, we shut it down, right? <laughs> and so that was truly the model. The model I was involved in that I left was a broke model. It wasn't going to work. So I went out on my own. I was doing really, really well. Life was great. And then when Jim said, hey, um, me and Jerry aren't going to work together, so just pay me directly, and I'll take it off the tab of what Jerry owes me. I said, well, if you're definitely not going to work together, I'd love to make you an offer. And I knew he wasn't into partnerships because they didn't work for him. So I said, hey, Jim, it'll be my company. 
I'll pay you off the top, like a speaker's bureau, 75%. I'll go create the product. He only had like two. And when I create the products, we'll do a some sort of you know royalty on it. And that first year, I took him from 4, 000, uh, 20 speaking dates at 4,000 each to 110 dates at 10,000 each, wow. then 25,000 each. And I started creating products. And I don't know, within a couple of years, you know, the money was flowing. And uh, it was flowing so well, Jim didn't have that much stuff. So I started another company called Your Success Store. So then I started booking Brian Tracy and Mark Victor Hansen, Les Brown, into all the companies I'd booked Jim into. And I started selling their products. And from there, it just took off. That's awesome. Yeah. So nice. That's a story hardly anyone knows. That's a great story. Well, you were just slowly dropping in like iconic people, you know, like Les Brown and Og Mandino and these people. Zig. I mean, I've worked with all of them. John Maxwell. It's incredible. So let's talk about some of the lessons that you learned from Jim because, you know, we see his quotes. And I mean, if you guys haven't gone online and looked at some of these quotes, they're timeless and they're amazing. Um, And I tell you what, I use them all the time. I'm actually doing a talk uh, at a, I'm actually a keynote at uh, Northern Arizona University next month. And I'm using one of his quotes as the basis for my talk, which is you can have a a formal education and make a living, or you can be self-educated and make a fortune. Yeah, it's a great one. It is a great one, you know? And I was like, and I, I, for some reason, when I got asked, I was like, that's exactly what I'm going to speak on because I had studied Jim Rohn. And so I would love to know, you know, how did he impact your life? What were some of the basic lessons? Because you had to have taken away some of those things today and implemented them in your life. And obviously, you're still very successful. So what are some of the things that you learned? Yeah. So again, growing up in a small town, not having any kind of mentorship, not having, you know, not being from an entrepreneurial family and, you know, moving to Dallas to start another little detail shop. And then I meet Jerry and I start going to these seminars, right, that they're putting on by Jim Rohn students. So that started kind of impacting me. Then I start promoting Jim. And I start hearing things for the first time. And, uh, you know, there's four or five things. I mean, there's dozens, right? But there's there's three or four that just really were impactful. And I think the first one is the simple, cliche-ish thing. Uh, for things to change, you have to change. Yes. And, you know, bottom line is it's not the government. It's not the president. It's not the economy. It's not your negative relatives. It's not your boss. Because at the end of the day, you know, 10 years will pass and two people, they could even be twins from the same family, you know, one's going to succeed and one's not. And it has nothing to do with all those things. And the most important things that affect our future, we get to control. All first, our attitude, our thoughts, our behavior, you know, where we invest our time. Just recently interviewed Dennis Waitley, and he has this thing called Prime Time is the is the main time. And like he wrote all his books, 16 books at night when other people watch mindless TV, right? Yes. And so, because his full-time job was a speaker, right? That took all his time. And so Jim just taught me, hey, really all the, and I was into politics. You know, I did pay attention. I did, you know, I could go either direction. I felt strongly about things. He said, feel strongly about yourself and make sure all this other stuff is not a diversion that gets you off track instead of paying attention to your own life. So that was great wisdom. Yeah, that was number one. Um, Another one would be, and this was huge, he taught me success is predictable. You know, it's just, and again, he compared things to nature. So having a garden, you know, you plant a tomato seed. You're going to get tomatoes. You want a vineyard. You plant it. Now, there's a lot of things that have to happen. you got to water the seed. you got to plant it at the right time, at the right place. you got to take care of it. And even sometimes you do all that and something happens, right? Things happen. You know, a hell storm comes. But more times than not, if you do the right things over a period of time, you're going to get a great result. It's predictable. And, you know, don't follow the exotic you know, and he would kind of just tell all these little things. People get caught up in all this exotic stuff that really takes us away from from the basics. And they're shooting for the Hail Mary. You know, they're shooting for the lottery in business, the get quick, uh, yep. get, get rich, rich quick. quick. Yep. But if you do the right, if you plant enough seeds in the right place, the right kind of seeds, the kind you want to get a harvest on, in, in due time, good things are going to happen. It's just find the right blueprint, 
right? So that gave me faith that, wow, if I do the right stuff, I'm going to get the right result. And so a lot of times I see people out in the marketplace, I'm saying, you know, why are they going for the quick fix? What's the get rich quick? What is that? Are they bad people? Oftentimes it's just they don't have faith that if they do the right stuff, they're going to get the right result, yeah. right? But once you really believe if I do the right things, like you can even be a person, I was having this conversation with someone yesterday, integrity, right? Doing the right things. Well, let's just say you're not even a, a person that thinks that way. But if you want the result, it's still the same thing. If you do the right stuff, you're going to get the result. You don't even have to take pride in, oh, I'm a good person. Just take pride in if you do the right stuff, the right thing's going to happen. So really having that faith. Mm -hmm. um, a third one would have been, this was huge, and this is different. But he said, be a student, not a follower. Make sure everything you do is the product of your own conclusion. Now, I come from you know, a little bit of a fundamentalist Christian background. And so I was very particular about what I would listen to, what I would read. But then Jim's like, be open to everything. Take it all in, but just make sure then you still make the decision. So it really opened me up to, I don't have to follow what anyone else says. You know, even I could be a huge fan of who they are. But how many times do we get caught up? And if someone's, you know, we really respect that all of a sudden now we have to take it all in. Oh, you know, this person says that, whoever it is, right? Business leaders, spiritual leaders. You know, some people have a lot of great stuff. Some of though, you just got to set it aside, yeah, right? right? Right, And um, But that was powerful. It's like, okay, I really felt this autonomy all of a sudden to make my own decisions, to come to my own conclusions, which opened the door for me to explore more and just be open and go in these different directions. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one, Ken, and this might have been the biggest, he said, to become successful, you have to bring value to the marketplace. He said, to become wealthy, you have to be valuable to valuable people. He didn't say you have to be a good networker. He, you know, he said you have to bring value. And so to me, uh, I get this a lot. Well, how do you have all these people, you know, these have done, done amazing things that are part of your world? It's because I put on big events and they would speak at them. I built a big list and I would promote them. I learned to become valuable to valuable people. You doing this podcast allows you to bring value to the marketplace. So right. having a Mark Victor Hansen, having a Robert Helms, having these amazing people come in uh, to spend time with you, they, they do it for a lot of reasons, but you're bringing value to them to expose them to your audience. So I don't know. I figured that out real quick. Yeah. It's how just, did you figure that out? I, know, I mean, you know, like, I, like here's a guy that had a detail shop yeah. that has taken, honestly, one of the most iconic people of the time. And a lot of people are taking things from Jim and, you know, changing oh, yeah. them out, you know, and making <laughs> them a little. But where did, where did Jim get all this inspiration? Yeah. So, you know, I had a great conversation with Hal Elrod. Have you read The Miracle Morning? Yes. So he just had me on his podcast. And so I'm sharing with him some similar things because it was mostly about Jim Rohn. And he says, dang, Kyle, those last four things you said, I have all those in my book. And I say, I said those. <laughs> and he goes, you know, Jim was my greatest influence. And I guess I didn't realize that's actually his quote. And I said, well, hold on, Hal. This is true for Jim. And it's true for all of us. Jim had influences. Earl Nightingale, uh, Napoleon Hill, all these other influences. And what happens is when we take it in. So I hear a Jim Rohn quote. And really, it might not even mean much to me until I experience it. Todd right. Stoudemire talked about this yesterday. Yeah. He said, you got to learn from failures. He said, I thought that was kind of silly. But then one day it clicked. And I realized, wow, I can save myself so much time by learning from failures. And we talked about that. And I think once you have something, you make it your own, and then it comes out the other side through a life experience, then you say it in such a way that's impactful and is meaningful to you. And how I think I arrived at that idea is all the time I have these ideas. It's like, wow, that is good. I had an aha, uh -huh and I had something happen, and now I label it with words, and it's like pretty brilliant. And then I realize, oh, Jim already said that. I learned, <laughs> you know, Jim already said that, you know, so much better. 
But now I own it because I went through the experience. And so I think once we go through it and we have our own life experience, it comes out in a different way, set a little differently, but it's also got a new energy. And so all of a sudden people hear, hear Ken McElroy say it, and the way you say it, because of your life experience, they receive it that way. A little differently. And I right? think that was – but Jim was the master. Like, he could take the complex, make it simple, add a little humor. You know, he was just the master. No, there's no question. I mean, if, you know, today I still obviously I, – I love Tony Robbins. I, I You know, I watch all these guys. They're still out there talking, and they bring me lots of inspiration. But there's pieces of Jim Rohn in all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and all of these speakers and all of these things I read. And I mean, it's everywhere. You know, what's really uh, cool for me to observe, because I went to see Tony not long ago and, you know, for it was a four day event and he name drops a lot of people because he's worked with presidents. But almost every time, like every time when he name drops someone, it's because he coaches them or he helped them or he influenced them. The one exception is Jim Rohn. And I bet 15 times he mentioned Jim Rohn as his mentor. And I'm arriving, and there's like this 20-something-year-old that I run into, and we're all trying to find seats together, and there were no seats. And uh, they had just flown in from California and come to find out they're very, you know, new age, astrological teacher, <clears throat> you know, not the typical Jim Rohn demographic. Sure. She was a huge Jim Rohn fan. Oh. Because of Tony. Yeah. You know, Darren Hardy calls Jim his mentor. Eric Worre calls Jim his mentor. Hal Elrod, Robert Helms, yeah. so many influential people right now talk about Jim Rohn. So I think he's bigger than he's ever been. And it's because this new generation does give him credit, right? And if they don't, uh, they can't really use it. Like, it, it looks bad. If you keep doing Jim Rohn quotes and you don't ever say Jim Rohn had an influence. Right, right. So I think it's just he had such a profound effect. It's it's incredible to me. The, um, well, you're certainly applying these lessons now, and I uh, I cannot thank you enough for that story. Uh, let, talk before we wrap up. Let's talk about these. Because okay. we were talking about these before <laughs> the podcast. These are like the treasury of quotes, and you did them with all these yeah. speakers that you yeah. represented. What an amazing idea. It was a God download. So it's 1993, and we do talk about it on the marketing uh, podcast, where I thought, how do I get Jim's message out in the world? And we'll, on that podcast, I'll explain the wheel and where this was born. But it really got down to what was Jim's secret sauce? What made him special? What made him unique? How do I get that out in the world? And this was 1993, and there were no Jim Rohn quotes. It's not like you go on Google, or it's not like Jim published them. I just thought, you know, what makes Jim so unique is he's so profound. He says these incredible things, you're right? It was just, and I thought maybe I could create a little booklet. Now the idea kept evolving. Let me put a to and a from in it. And then do I, do I make them nice? So let me do leatherette and gold foil. Do I sell them for five bucks? No, I want people to give them away. By the way, Jim Rohn fans are advocates. They want to share his message more than anyone I ever met, right? A Jim Rohn fan lights up. And they start giving you Jim Rohn quotes, right? And so it's like, let me make it, you know, and again, it got changed, the company that bought me, but it had a to and a from, had a quote, but then plenty of space to write a personal note. And then you turn it, and here's how you buy 10 or 100 or 1,000. So instead of, instead of selling them for five, I sold them for a dollar. Well, you could buy them for two, but if you bought 10, they were only a dollar. And if you bought 100, they were 60 cents. And if you bought 1,000, and I would print them for 35 cents, you know, but I didn't do them to make a profit, although I did. And it's a brilliant idea when you can get people to pay you to no go market yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay you. And pay then I had to teach them how to market. You know, I had to teach network marketers and insurance people and people in real estate how to go tell the story and give them away. And true story, from the moment it took me ten months to do it, because the other thought is I'm a, I'm a little bit of a maximizer. So I'm thought, well, if I do the little book, maybe I should do a big book, like a hardbound, really cool. So I ended up having to do both. And I came up with almost a thousand quotes, you know, going through all the seminars, going through the book Jim had, going through all the notes I'd taken, got it down to 365. Someone once said, hey, did you ever think about doing a calendar? Yeah, maybe I did when I said 365, <laughs> but it was never high enough on our list to ever go yeah. do a calendar, right? Not yet. That didn't make that. Well, that didn't make the top 100 good ideas. But I did that just in case I wanted to do a you know, a quote and then spend the whole, you know, make it like a devotional for a year. But we never did that. 
But the hardbound had 365 quotes, and then this was why I did it, though. The excerpts from the Treasury of Quotes. And then this had 110. Then I put excerpts from our products and uh, had my catalog in the back. And then I had to get them out to the marketplace, right? This is pre, pre-internet, so through events. But once I started getting them out in the marketplace, our mailbox started filling up. People buying everything in the back, the catalog. Our mm. phone started ringing off the hook. And we had this genius question back then when the phone rang. How'd you get our number? Someone gave me a quote book. I, you know, I was at my chiropractor, and there was these quote books laying around. Oh, wow. My coach gave me a they quote everywhere. book. They went everywhere. Yeah, at the Bible study, they gave me a quote book. <clears throat> So I, at the same time when I did Jim, I knew I wanted to do one for Brian Tracy. So about a year later, I did Brian's, and then I was working a lot with Mark Victor Hansen. So then I did Mark's, and then a couple of years later, did one for Zig and did one for uh, Dennis Waitley. And, but, you know, it was such Jim's wheelhouse of being a wordsmith that with Jim, I ended up over a long period of time selling six million of them. And the others, about two million all combined, but it was all about cross pollinating. It was it was it was a lead generation tool, and again, it's this thing we talk about in the marketing one about the wheel getting people on the wheel. But that was Jim's secret sauce, the most profound wordsmith. So yeah, on the hardback, I printed five thousand signed and numbered, and five thousand regular, and I'd sell one for twelve and the other for twenty four. And but those were just to have some extra products. That's incredible. What an incredible story. Um, so I know you're working on a big project right now. It's super exciting. Do uh, you want to chat about it real quick? Uh, well, pray tell. You're coming up. Uh, well, you're you're interviewing some pretty incredible people. And um, I know you're rolling out some uh, podcasts and some products coming up. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, here, here's what really caused me to want to start a podcast. Obviously, I'm a marketer, so I understand the marketing side, and I'm all about that. But the biggest driving force is I have an inner circle. And along the way, we have some pretty cool guests show up. You know, Mark Victor Hansen, and we have some amazing members. And I've had Phil Collin and Def Leppard come. And and I would see these comments from people. It's like, you know, I got to meet Mark Victor Hansen, or I got to meet Morgan Mason, or I get to be in an inner circle with Robert uh, Helms and Ron White. And I realized I have such access to people that I take for granted at times. You know, I got these cool relationships. Well, I, I know. I went backstage with Def Leppard after yeah. the concert from you. That was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Hanging out with Phil Collin. So, so I got to thinking, if I could spend two hours with Jim Rohn, which I spent hundreds of hours, but I mean, if I could today spend two hours and interview him and get him to open up and tell the stories you would never hear anywhere else... Uh, which I got those opportunities myself, you know, is there an audience that want to hear that? And that is kind of my gift to them. Yeah. Now it's not a good marketing plan. You know, you need like 20 minute podcasts to, to get the downloads, but it truly is something I can give that makes me unique because of the access I have. So with that, I started a long form podcast. Robert Helms was two and a half hours. Ron White was two and a half hours. Nui Scruggs, seven time Emmy winner was a couple hours. I just had Darren Hardy at his house and Darren has not done a podcast in three years. He doesn't do uh, any kind of endorsements. He doesn't do book forwards. You know, he gave me an incredible testimonial. We did two hour long form. He's like, ask me anything beforehand. I'm like, Darren, you know, everyone knows you as the personal development guy, but I really want to talk about marketing because I know you're a genius marketer. Can we pull back the curtain and just be really honest? about that and be honest about the entrepreneurial journey you've had, failures, successes. He goes, yeah, any, ask me anything. Did that with Darren, uh, John Asaraf, where I knew some of John's failures. Like he, we had done some calls 20 years ago where we're talking about stuff. He said, just ask me anything. Like, wow. That, by the way, is that the greatest? Because my experience has been that all of these people will tell the truth. Right. They will. They will. And yeah. it's going to, I cannot wait to yeah. hear Yeah. And this. then Dennis Waitley at his house and Brian Tracy at his house. And they were all over two hours long and just phenomenal. And I enjoyed it. And those that will enjoy it will enjoy it. And those that couldn't be bothered, that's fine too, because it is a bit philosophical. But I'm a very principle-based marketer. I've never found that tactics at the end of the day are where you're going to find your greatest success because just like you and Robert Helms were talking about earlier, 
The compounding effect is when you do things principle-based, not when you turn through people. If you're turning through people, you're starting over every day, right? You're hunting. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really having a good time. I would do it just for me. It's like, you know, but then I'm not really bringing value to them. We get to hang out for a couple of hours and I love it and hopefully they love it. But if we can take that to the masses and people get to know more about them, I just think it's a win, win, win. Well, thank you. I, I think, you know, we have to be very careful about who we listen to and who our teachers are. And, um, you know, it's going to be amazing to hear you interview these people that are really have been and some still are at the very top of their game. And there's a reason. It's not luck. It's super strategic and it's their philosophy, their character, and their integrity, all of those things combined. I cannot wait. Thank you. And I tell you, like Dennis Waitley, he's 87. But wow, just so lucid and just so much phenomenal information. So principle-based. So about living and life. So, Yeah, I, I and I think that's kind of a theme consistently, certainly with you, with a lot of people that we hang out with. And um, anyway, that's going to be a phenomenal project. Thanks, brother. I can't wait. Thank you, man. Yeah. Really appreciate it.